Good morning. I want to welcome you to the Union Church Studios in Foxborough, Mass. It's good to be here, and it's good to have all of you who are watching this morning in various places, the church family in our immediate area, other friends in Delaware, North Carolina, Florida. I want to say a special good morning to Stephen, who's watching from his group home, and his mom, who I'm sure is watching from her home. We welcome you. We miss you. I want to say a special good morning to Adeline, who I think is watching. Her grandfather is here running the camera. And Adeline, I did your parents' wedding. So it's because of my good work that you were here. So Adeline, we're so glad that you were watching. Let's begin our service with a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you that we are gathered here in this place today. Thank you that we can join together from wherever we are as one church together in Jesus Christ. Thank you that you are present in every place. Thank you that you, there is a God in heaven who loves us. So bless this service today, we pray to each and one of us. Apply your truth to our lives, for we need it. In the name of your Son, we pray. Amen. Before we sing, I have two announcements I want to mention to you. I, one announcement. Um, Governing Board is meeting on Tuesday night on Zoom at 6.30 p.m. We are going to be discussing whether we extend being closed or we, or we open. So if you'd like to join in on that, contact the church office and we'll make sure you get the link. It's a public meeting. Anyone in the church is welcome to join in also on Wednesday night. We're studying the life of King David was the consensus of the group meeting on Wednesday night, so you're welcome to join us for that at 7 p.m. Shall we worship the Lord together from wherever we may be? My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the but holy truth on Jesus' name. On Christ the solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand. All other ground is sinking sand. When darkness veils his lovely face, I rest on his unchanging grace. I'm alive and well. 
Let's take a part of our service to pray for the prayer requests of the, the community of faith that is here and sometimes requests from outside our church family also. I got a text a moment ago, I wish we could all be together. And that's certainly a prayer request and something that we all long for. If you are watching and you don't think you are missed, think again. We really miss being together. Um, we do have some ongoing prayer requests. George Sarikas, I know you're watching. We are going to pray for you every week until you are through with your treatments. We have a new prayer request. I was going to begin the prayer time by saying that our COVID people within the church family are unanimously improving, but I have been asked to bring before the Lord in prayer Annie Kaler, who has... COVID and has been ill for quite a while now, and she's still really sick. So we love you, Annie, and we're going to pray for you this morning. We have other ongoing prayer requests, and I'm going to read from Psalm 37 just a few words. I was young, and now I am old, yet I have never seen the righteous forsaken or their children begging bread. They are always generous and lend freely. Their children will be blessed. Turn from evil and do good. Then you will dwell in the land forever. For the Lord loves the just and will not forsake his faithful ones. We're going to be thinking today about during hard times, it feels as though God isn't aware but as we go into prayer, our thought is, for the Lord loves the just, those who follow him, and will not forsake, he will not forsake his faithful ones. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much that you are a God who is holy. We do not live in a random universe. We live in a space that you watch over and you govern out of holy character. And out of your holiness comes your justice. And out of your holiness comes your love. And out of your holiness comes your mercy and grace. And these things are combined at the cross of your son, Jesus Christ, where your justice was satisfied, where your mercy and grace freely flow as your son gave his life on the cross, not for any sin he had ever committed, for he was sinless, but for the sins of all the world and applied to all who look to him by faith and trust in him as Savior. Thank you that your justice is satisfied and we may be forgiven and we may experience your mercy and your grace. And Father, as we go through difficult times in this world and they come more often than we would ever wish, you are still faithful. You are still aware. You are still at work. You still love. Father, thank you today that most of those we have, who we have prayed for 
who are experiencing the illness of COVID have had mild cases or are now recovering. But Father, we bring Annie before you this morning. She is dear to us and our church family and Danny. Father, may you minister to her in body and in spirit. Just Lord, help her to be well. Help, help her to shake off this illness. Help her to feel strong and healthy and well with an appetite and able to return to work and live her normal life. Bless her, we pray, and her family with her. They are dear and loved in your sight. Continue to be with George Zarekas and all his family who are precious before you, Heavenly Father. May treatment be effective for George and his well-being and his length of days. And as we pray each week, may you reduce, we pray, any side effects, any difficulty that he experiences. Others in our church family, some spoken, some unspoken, have ongoing health issues. Each one is loved, first by you, but also by us. Father, grant that doctors would have direction and would be able to locate treatments for those in need of it. Father, grant that treatment would be effective. We would pray together this morning. Some among us have experienced losses of loved ones in recent months or years, for loss does not evaporate immediately, but lingers. Father, grant comfort, grant peace, grant healing, we pray this morning. Some in our church family and others in our communities or our extended personal biological families are in recovery from addiction to various substances. Some meet here and we are grateful for the privilege. Father, grant that those who are struggling with these situations may experience freedom as they call upon a higher power, and you are the only higher power. Father, grant that they would come to realize who you are and have true freedom from not only addiction, but also in soul and in spirit and in relationships and in every area of life. Be with a family we're praying for who has a deeply painful separation. Father, grant that there might be reconciliation. Grant that the one responsible for this, the one person, would realize their error. Father, grant this family healing, we pray. Be with Tammy and I in her role as our children's ministry director. Be with that children's ministry which is suspended because of the current situation. But Father, bless it in the days and weeks and months ahead. Grant her wisdom. Grant her insight. Grant that that ministry would return and would grow and be strengthened. Father, we pray for our country and those serving it and the armed forces around the world that you might grant them protection Grant them peace. Grant that our nation would experience the spiritual renewal that, unlike all the solutions offered by politicians, spiritual renewal is what we truly need, a turning away from our foolishness and to your guidance, to humility before you, toward repentance as the great leaders of the past, President Lincoln and others, called us to. Be with our world, for you are trying to speak to us through COVID. Father, that we may, as a, as a world and a humanity, turn to you and humble ourselves before you. Father, we worship you today as our Master Jesus taught his disciples to pray, whose Father, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. If you are watching this morning, and you'd like to turn to the passage we're going to be looking at. It is Genesis chapter 37, beginning at verse 12. 
Genesis chapter 37, beginning at verse 12. For those few of us who are here, it is on page 28 in the Bible in the pew if you'd like to follow along. Genesis chapter 37, beginning at verse 12. If you're watching and you see any miscommunications happening this morning, there's always, my middle name is Confusion, William Confusion Dudley. So I'm causing some little minor mishaps here this morning. But Bud Smith, Bud Smith was a guy who attended here, who several of us here this morning remember well. We love Bud Smith. He was an awesome guy. He attended about the first 10 years that I was the pastor here, nine to be exact. He was a Wednesday Bible study, Sunday, never missed it kind of guy. If he was going away, he'd always tell me if he wasn't coming. He and Flossie raised six kids on Cocasset Street here in Foxborough. And Bud was an excellent athlete, a really good athlete when he was young and all through his life. He was an excellent athlete. And he was a great golfer. I still have a wedge that... Bud gave to me many years ago, and I still try to use it, not as well as he did. And every once in a while, Bud and I would play a round of golf. And Bud began coaching me, hoping he could improve my golf game. One day, my dad, my friend Phil Human, Bud and I were playing as a foursome at Foxborough Country Club. And lo and behold, I parred the first hole, a par four. On the second hole, a par three, I actually landed it on the green. I two-putted to make a par again. On the third hole, that was the, pardon me, I, I bogeyed the second hole. I parred the third hole. I was one over par as I stood on the fourth tee, which is a long par five, that I have a propensity for hitting my drive into the woods on the right. This time I split the middle, hit my second shot over the hill if you've played there, and my third shot, that wedge, hitting that wedge Bud gave me, landed on the green, and I had a 20-foot putt for birdie, which would bring me back to even par for the first four holes. Bud was almost ecstatic standing on the green with the others, watching me line up that 20-foot putt. I could see in his face. He knew his coaching was paying off, and my golf game was improving. I putted that putt for birdie to go back to even par for four holes at Foxborough Country Club, and I left it five feet tentatively short. I made up for it on my putt for par. I left that four feet by the hole, too strong, My four-foot putt for bogey missed, as did my 18-inch putt for double bogey. And my fifth putt finally went in the hole for an eight. I looked up to see the look on Bud's face, and I couldn't see it because his back was toward me. Bud was already walking toward the next hole. He had given up. And from that moment on, poor Bud Smith, as wonderful a man as he was, gave up ever trying to coach me at golf again. The wheels came off all at once, and I returned to my normal bogey, double bogey type of golf. Bud never tried to coach me again. He knew a losing cause when he saw one. Sometimes life is like a bad day on the golf course. Everything seems to be going really well in our life. Our family is doing well. Our friends are around us. Our job is working well. Maybe this goes on for many, many years. Maybe we're one of those people who doesn't have it go on for very long. But then all of a sudden in life, an unexpected struggle comes, maybe a series of them. The wheels kind of fall off in life. Our kidney isn't working properly. We have trouble at work. Someone in our family is ill. Our transmission quits when it has only 43,521 miles on our car. Family members blow up at each other on Christmas Day, and six months later, when you want to have everyone together on the 4th of July, people still are angry and not speaking. And when those experiences happen in our life, and they're more frequent than we wish, we ask ourselves, does God really know about this? Does God still love me? 
We began the new year looking at the life of Joseph, not the one in Matthew and Luke, but the one in Genesis, the patriarch Joseph. And Joseph was a marked man. He was marked by God for great things and marked by his family for not so great things. He had dreams in which his family bowed down to him. Two dreams, all 10 of them, all 10 brothers and his parents bowing down to him. And he also had a propensity to do the right thing and to speak up and report people who weren't doing the right thing. In this case, as a teenager, he reported his brothers to his father. His brothers were incensed, first by his dreams that they would bow down to him, and secondly by the idea that he would report to their father that they were not doing their job. Joseph didn't have the wisdom to zip his lip when it would have been tactful to do so. And yet, Joseph still had no reason to believe that things would go south in his life, that the wheels would come off when his dad sent him on an errand in the passage that Mora is going to read for us today. But Joseph's life, like our life, took a terrible turn, and we'll hear what it is if Mora could read for us. Genesis 37, verse 12 to 36. Joseph sold, his, sold by his brothers. Now his brothers had gone to graze their father's flocks near Shechem. And Israel said to Joseph, As you know, your brothers are grazing the flocks near Shechem. Come, I am going to send you to them. Very well, he replied. So he said to him, Go and see if all is well with your brothers and with the, the flocks, and bring word back to me. Then he sent him off from the valley of Hebron. When Joseph arrived, arrived at Shechem, a man found him wandering around in the fields and asked him, What are you looking for? He replied, I'm looking for my brothers. Can you tell me where they are grazing their flocks? They have moved from here, the man answered. I heard them say, Let's go to Dothan. So Joseph went after his brothers and found them near Dothan. But they saw him in the distance, and before he reached them, they plotted to kill him. Here comes that dreamer, they said to each other. Come now, let's kill him and throw him into one of these cisterns and say that a ferocious animal devoured him. Then we'll see what comes of his dreams. When Reuben heard this, he tried to rescue him from their hands. Let's not take his life, he said. Don't shed any blood. Throw him into the cistern here in the desert, but don't lay a hand on him. Reuben said this to rescue him from them and take him back to his father. So when Joseph came to his brothers, they stripped him of his robe, the richly ornamented robe he was wearing, and they took him and threw him into the cistern. Now the cistern was empty. There was no water in it. As they sat down to eat their meal, they looked up and saw a caravan of Ishmaelites be, uh, coming from Gilead. Their camels were loaded with spices, balm, and myrrh, and they were on their way to take them down to Egypt. Judah said to his brothers, what will we gain if we kill our brother and cover up his blood? Come, let's sell him to the Ishmaelites and not lay our hands on him. After all, he is our brother our own flesh and blood. His brothers agreed. So when the Midianite merchants came by, his brothers pulled Joseph up out of the cistern and sold him for 20 shekels of silver to the Ishmaelites who took him to Egypt. When Reuben returned to the cistern and saw that Joseph was not there, he tore his clothes. He went back to his brothers and said, the boy isn't there. Where can I turn now? Then they got Joseph's robe, slaughtered a goat, and dipped the robe in the blood. They took the ornamented robe back to their father and said, We found this. Examine it to see whether it is your son's robe. He recognized it and said, It is my son's robe. Some ferocious animal has devoured him. Joseph has surely been torn, but torn to pieces. Then Jacob tore his clothes, put on sackcloth, and mourned his son for many days. All his sons and daughters came to comfort him, but he refused to be comforted. No, he said, 
In mourning, I will go down to the grave to my son. So his father wept for him. Meanwhile, the Midianites sold Joseph in Egypt to Potiphar, one of Pharaoh's officials, the captain of the guard. The word of the Lord. Thank you, Mara, so much for reading that. An excellent, excellent reading. So, Joseph already has his brothers annoyed with him. He's revealed these dreams that he's had. He's reported to Dad that they weren't doing their job in a previous episode that, of the passage that we read earlier last week. And things get worse for Joseph dramatically in the passage that Maura read for us this morning. He's 17 years old. He doesn't know when to keep his lip zipped. His brothers have a growing resentment of him, and his brothers are actual criminals. They see him coming, and they begin to plot his death. They begin to plot to kill him. Above the grave of Ronald Reagan, there's a quote that was sent to me. I know in my heart that man is good, and good will eventually triumph. Joseph experiences here exactly the opposite, and the biblical claim really is that mankind can be evil, that good, God always triumphs, but, go, but good does not always triumph. And Joseph is about to experience this. Joseph is about to experience that even in our own families, as we talked about last week, there can be evil, there can be resentment, there can be destructive behavior. We might summarize it this morning by saying, people are more sinful than we even estimate. We see on the news a neighbor saying, I can't believe what happened on my street and that someone would do such a terrible thing. But people are more sinful than we estimate. People can be more evil than we expect. Ask anyone in law enforcement. Ask anyone who's been a landlord how many times the tenants have said the check is in the mail when they know full well it isn't. And Joseph, pardon the pun, in his wildest dreams could never have dreamed that his brothers would sell him into slavery down in Egypt. He approaches them probably expecting a friendly reception probably expecting to have a nice conversation and time with them. But they've been off 60 miles from home is where Dothan is located, from where Jacob lived. He's come 60 miles to where his brothers are, and his brothers out here can do anything they wish to do. They can be as cruel as they wish to their kid brother Joseph, the youngest of all of them. And in context, it's only Reuben and Judah who speak against killing him. All the others, eight out of ten, are in favor of doing away with Joseph. And so they heartlessly sell Joseph into slavery to the Ishmaelites, a distant related people group, and down to Egypt he goes. And in the context of their murderous minds, selling their baby brother into slavery and sending him off to a foreign country at, at the age of 17, in their brains, somehow that is merciful. 60 miles he had gone to locate his brothers, far away from their father, and there was no such thing as forensics, no such thing as a police unit that will tape off the area of the crime and they put goat blood on his robe and they didn't have forensics to determine it's not human blood, it's not Joseph's blood, it's the, the blood of a goat. Jeremiah 17 verse 9 says, the human heart is the most deceitful of all things and desperately wicked. Who realizes how this is, how bad it is, is the quote, the Holy Spirit Speaking through Jeremiah, the human heart is the most deceitful of all things and desperately wicked. We want to think that isn't true. But Joseph experienced what we may experience as well, the downside of living in a fallen world and the evil that lurks in the heart of human beings. We're all, every one of us, a mixture of the image of God and therefore the nobility of his character. And we saw in 9-11 firefighters running into the Twin Towers 
knowing that they were structurally unsound because of the fire above them. That's the imagio di, the image of God within us and the nobility the human race is capable of. But the downside is we're fallen people made in the image of God, and so we have a sinful side. And so at times that sin is corrupted even into evil, what we use in, say in, refer to in English as evil. And our common everyday sinfulness goes something like we talk poorly of someone over here and then we meet them face to face and we're all warm and fuzzy and we certainly don't tell them what we were saying about behind their back over here. And we do things like this. We tell a lie to a loved one just because it's easier to get away with something or to avoid controversy. And those little common everyday sinful things degenerate into humanity from there and the evil we are capable of. The morning I was working on this message, the six o'clock news came on and there was a story on there about a woman who went to Market Basket somewhere in southern New Hampshire and while she was in there on the street outside in front of Market Basket, it's just, a, it's just a, a normal day, everybody's shopping or going to work. While she's in there, two men on the street start arguing. One pulls out a gun and shoots the other. And he runs off behind Market Basket somewhere and the police come and they don't know where the shooter is. So the police come in the store and the woman told the story of how they were all herded into a back area and they were, they were locked in and, and supposedly safe there, but as, as 30 or so random shoppers stood with each other in this terrifying situation, they began to wonder, is the shooter hiding here among us or will the shooter come in a side door somewhere? And the woman said she texted her husband and her sister and said, I love you, fearing that the shooter might come in and she might still be shot. She said, I was shocked that such an incident would occur while I was shopping at Market Basket. Don't be shocked. Evil is real. The human heart is the most deceitful of all things and desperately wicked. The Bible presents a real picture of what humanity is like, the imagio di and the goodness within us and the fallen sinfulness of humanity. And Joseph here, in the middle of a day, in the middle of doing an errand for his dad, experiences the evil downside of the heart of humanity. It is not good. It is capable of being deceitful. It is capable of being wicked. And his own brothers sell him into slavery. And off he goes, down to Egypt, down to a life of slavery among people he doesn't even know the language of, and among people who are completely strangers. He becomes someone's human possession because of what his brothers believe is an act of mercy aside from killing him. People, remember this, people are more sinful than we estimate them to be, including ourselves. We have to watch ourselves, watch our thoughts, our choices, our words, our attitudes. And this down story of Joseph, this downside, reminds us our faith, if we are followers of Christ, nevertheless, sincere followers of Christ, our faith does not exempt us from experiencing the fallenness of the world around us. Missionaries from Christian aid are kidnapped in Haiti and held for ransom because of the evil that lives in the hearts of people, our faith does not exempt us from mistreatment because we are followers of Christ. Joseph's brothers were clearly spiritually ill. They were resistant to God. They didn't want to hear that God was choosing Joseph for a special mission and letting him know through the dreams that God gave him Jesus was faced with the same as brothers mocked him. He had brothers born after him of Joseph and Mary, and they mocked him. They said, if you're the Messiah, show yourself to the world. Make a big scene. King David was rebuked by an angry brother who was in the army of Israel just before David went out and won the great battle against Goliath. And people may look at you and I and say, you be used by God, you you repair cars for a living. You're a teacher's aide. 
You're unemployed. You can barely pay your bills. You've only got a high school diploma. God use you. You're a normal person struggling to get by in life. You have pretensions like God can use you somehow to help someone else. And people will oppose us. And people may be cruel toward us. And they will succeed at times harming us, usually as collateral damage to something that's happening. But spiritual resistance to God is the number one disease that all of us carry. It's the number one destructive issue of the world. And whether we call it resistance to God or resistance to doing the right thing, insistence on defining for ourselves what is right and wrong as opposed to what God has said is right and wrong leads to all the trouble that humanity experiences directly or indirectly. Declaring our independence from God is the spiritual disease that we carry and the disease that leads toward all the trouble because whenever you move away from holy, it's always toward profane. By definition, can be nothing but leaving the holy is toward the profane. It's leaving peace toward the turmoil. It's leading away from loving people in the way that God created us to, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And it ends up that you're in market basket and someone is shooting at someone else outside the door and you're shocked. But we aren't exempt from experiencing the fallenness of the human race. Don't be surprised. Jesus was not exempt. Paul was not exempt. David was not exempt. We will not be exempt. Bad things do happen to followers of Christ and to good people because humanity is more wicked than we ever estimated. Reuben and Judah, verses 21 and 2 and 26 and 7, Reuben and Judah, two of the older brothers, try to, they try to help their younger brother. Older brothers try to always help their younger brothers, but they don't prevail except in the sense that Joseph is sold in a caravan of traders, and down he goes to Egypt, down to slavery, a horrifying act perpetrated on a 17-year-old. And you know who isn't mentioned in this whole chapter? God. No mention of God. No intervention from God. No word of encouragement from God. In this whole passage, I should say, not the chapter, but the passage, God is never mentioned. Here's Joseph. He's trusted in God with his young life. He feels like God has spoken to him through these dreams, and he's right. He has every reason to believe God is out there. God will be looking out for me. And the next thing he knows, he's in a, he's in a camel train, a trading train, on his way down to be resold in the land of Egypt as a slave. And God does nothing to intervene and rescue him. God remains silent in the situation of Joseph. But God's silence, we learn from the life of Joseph, is always deliberate. God always has a plan. And if he's holding back intervening, it's because he's waiting for the right moment. And if he says nothing to us, feels like he's saying nothing to us in our suffering, it's because God is deliberate, God is intentional, and he has a plan, and he hasn't taken our eye off him. He hasn't taken his eye off of us. He's not mentioned in this passage. He's implied in the dreams that Joseph tells his brothers earlier in the chapter, but when his brothers throw him in a well earlier in the chapter, then sell him into slavery, God is silent. There's nothing he says, nothing he does, no indication that God is paying attention to Joseph. There's only silence. There's only silence from God. No mercy, no intervention, no stranger who comes riding in like Clint Eastwood to rescue the day. No divine intervention, only a silent sitting back and watching and allowing his chosen man, Joseph, to go down into Egypt in slavery. His chosen man to be treated 
cruelly. Is God mean? Does God be nice one day and not so nice the rest, the next day just to see how we behave? I had a friend who had a dog when we were about 13. The dog was tied outside the kitchen to a set of wooden stairs that went up into the house through the kitchen. And the dog would, on its leash, go around under there and would dig under there in the dirt when it was hot weather and hide in the shade under the steps. Or if it was raining, it could go under there and it was dry under there so that it was like a dog house for it, basically the stairs. But because people came and went from that doorway, the dog barked a lot for attention. The dog would bark. People would come. The dog would bark. People would be in the kitchen. The dog could hear them. The dog would bark. So one day, my friend's father held the dog down on the ground. And if I remember, he kind of used his body to hold the dog so the dog couldn't move. And he said to the dog over and over again, be quiet, be quiet. And the, the dad, my friend's dad was laughing as he did this. And my friend was laughing, and his brother was laughing. And I was extremely uncomfortable. It felt very mean as he was pinning the dog in place so the dog couldn't move, saying to the dog over and over again, be quiet, be quiet. And after what felt like forever, he, he let the dog up, and the dog jumped around and looked kind of if a dog has hurt feelings, probably it had that look on its face, but it felt mean to be then, mean to me then, and it felt, feels today like it was a mean way to supposedly discipline a dog, like the dad was just showing he was bigger and stronger than the dog. Is that what God's like? Is God like that when we're in trouble? Does he... Does he hold back? Does he not intervene? Does he hold us down with circumstances of life and not let us move? Does God silently, for no purpose except it gives him some sort of thrill, allow us to go through difficult circumstances? Is that what Joseph was wondering? What was Joseph wondering as he went in that train down, down, down to Egypt? Is God loving but has a mean streak? God described his heart in Exodus 34, verse 6 to Moses because Moses had asked him, I want to know you. I want to know what you're really like. And God allowed Moses to hide in the rocks as God passed by an appearance of the Lord. And the Lord said these words to describe his character. Here's the character of God. The Lord passed by him, meaning Moses, and proclaimed. This is the Lord speaking of his heart. The Lord, the Lord God, merciful and gracious, long-suffering, slow to anger, abundant in love and faithfulness. That's how God describes his heart. Merciful, gracious, long-suffering, slow to get angry at us, abundant in love, more than we can imagine, and faithfulness. Exodus 34, verse 6. And the character of God doesn't change when we're sold into slavery in Egypt, or we have a car accident, or an illness is revealed within us by our doctor, or our spouse abandons us and goes off and somewhere else, or we lose our job, or we can't pay the rent, whatever it is, God's character doesn't change because our circumstances are different, and if he allows those things in our life, his silence we will discover in the life of Joseph, Joseph is intentional, and he has a good purpose that we seek him that we pray, that we seek his word, and that we seek to know him. As Moses said, I want to know you, Lord. I want to know your character. People are more sinful than we realize. Don't be so surprised when they're meaner and more deceitful than we can even expect or imagine. We credit the human race sometimes too well. 
and they will surprise us. We are not exempt as followers of Christ. Because we know God, because we're seeking God, does not mean we have a cone around us and are exempt from the difficult things that take place in the world. Things will come upon us. We will be mistreated. We will experience misfortune. But if God is silent in the moment, it does not mean he does not have a purpose. It does not mean his eye is taken off us. It does not mean he doesn't have our best interest in mind. Pain can be God's classroom. He will teach us his way. And it's because he loves us. Say it with me three times in your home. There is a God in heaven who loves me. There is a God in heaven who loves me. There is a God in heaven who loves me. Father, thank you for these great truths we are experiencing through the life of Joseph. He suffered greatly, yet we will see he remained true to you and you were faithful to him in your timing. Father, we experience the sinfulness of a fallen world and even the evil. But thank you that if you are silent, it does not mean you've forgotten us. It does not mean our cause is unimportant to us. Quite the contrary. You are loving and gracious, slow to anger, abundant in love and faithfulness. We thank you in the name of your Son. Amen. heaven who loves you his eye is on you he's aware of your life he's aware of your circumstances if he's silent he still has good intentions from whatever we are going through we love and miss you we will be together again soon we are one church one church together wherever we may be through God's son Jesus Christ May the grace and peace of our Lord Jesus Christ be yours in abundance. Amen.